I'm Dave Michelson. I'm a have been a senior analyst for the past um, 10 years at the city, and today actually is my first day at the University of North Carolina at Asheville, and they have a software um, research group called NEMAC. Um, so, um, my name is Cameron Carlisle. I'm a civic programmer with the city of Asheville. I've only been in the city for about 14 months or something like that. So, yeah. So, um, what we're here to talk to you about today is. Um, uh, app that we built um, called Simplicity, and we call it Simplicity City Data Simplified. So the idea of simplicity is something that kind of has been brewing with us for maybe the whole nine years I've been at the city, um, and even more so maybe um, four years ago we came to our first summit and um, kind of got inspired to try to start doing things different. I've always felt like we've done things different, but Coming to the summit, we suddenly were given tools to really try things different. So, you know, we started getting involved with the brigade, um, putting on hackathons. We um, would, I would go to lean startup circles and um, we'd participate in startup weekends. So we started getting this whole new way of thinking, um, maybe a lot different than you would see at other city IT departments. And that's kind of the idea behind City Data Simplified is this idea that we would, we took from the summits and you've heard it, you know, this whole time you've been here this, this year too is this whole idea of the, uner, the users at the center of the designing everything. And that's kind of where we start. Um, <clears throat> I always like to bring some, something from baseball. And um, one of my favorite is, is, is Yogi Berra. And I'm not really a Yankees fan, but I'll, I'll accept him. Because he says crazy nonsensical stuff. Um, but this one isn't so crazy as some of the others. And really for me, this kind of brings the whole idea of what we want to do with simplicity, right? You can observe a lot by just watching. And, and that's really powerful to me because what he's, say, what he's saying is, like, you don't have to do a lot. If you just watch, you'll learn just about everything you need to know. And, and that's true in life and in baseball. So I'm going to bring you to the story and um, this crazy square spinning globe. You may be wondering why you're looking at a square spinning globe, but um, this is our app that we had for maybe since 2006, so almost 10 years, right? This is what most users saw most of the time when they used that app, was this spinning globe. So what, if, what, what people would tell us is, you know, what, what do you like or what do you dislike about our app? All that I would hear is, oh, that crazy spinning square globe, I want to kill it. Um, <laughs> so that tell, the, this tells the story of the types of tools we were building. They, you know, they had some use to them, but it really kind of pissed people off. So this, this is kind of the interface that we had. Um, it probably looks familiar. If you're a GIS person, you've probably seen this same type of app over and over and over again, right? It's this presentation of you know, thousands of layers, you know, 30, 40 buttons, and you can turn them off and on. You can find out all kinds of things, but you have to be a GIS expert to use it. So we kind of, as a GIS people, would expect everybody, including like my mom, my grandmother, or anyone out in the street to use and become a GIS professional to find information. That's a problem. So when you click on things and you get that spinning globe and you're really trying to answer questions, and this is what you get, it's, it's not fun. There was different times we had this whole suite of applications we called Map Asheville, and you know, we had actually won awards for them. In 2006, the idea of creating an app that actually like this was a development mapper that showed development in town. The idea of like focusing an app on one particular topic was a lot different than other GIS departments had yet done. Um, so this was like an example of that first thing before we even came to the summit that we were kind of like had this idea that we wanted to focus around customers, but we didn't really know how to do it. Instead, we gave them this, right? So. We just continued their frustration. Everywhere they went, they would see this. And, and we definitely heard about it. But a lot of summits, and we, we just learned a whole lot. So I'm going to turn it over to Cameron. For right. So like Dave was saying, we learned a lot from past, um, from past summits. And um, we knew that when we were going to make this new, this new solution, we were going to do it differently. Um, we weren't going to do it the same way we had been doing it before. Um, and what we were going to do is we were going to borrow things from like the startups that would actually be used to develop a new product. Um, and this might look familiar to a lot of you. This is the kind of lean startup uh, build, measure, learn cycle where you have an idea, you 
build um, on that idea, then you get some sort of minimal viable product, you measure how effective that product is, um, you analyze some data, and then you learn from what you just did, and then you keep iterating on that same, same principle over and over again. But what we also wanted to do is keep the user at the center of this entire process. So as we were iterating, as we were going through this build, measure, learn cycle, we wanted to keep the user at the very center of that. So in order to do that, what we did is we started with user research. Um, and this wasn't super complicated. This wasn't really fancy. Um, I think when we started out, we brought, I think it was about 12 stakeholders from around the, the city in, and we just sat down around a table um, uh, and kind of just discussed what they felt like their needs were. After we had gone through that, we brought in three other people from around the city and sat them down um, in front of a computer um, and did a Google like Hangout on air and um, basically just asked them some very simple questions. Questions like, what type of questions do you get from the public? Or um, how do you answer those questions? Um, do you use any other mapping um, websites, like besides MapAshable, besides our existing tools? Are you using like Google Maps or Google Street View or stuff like that? Um, and then we really wanted them to show us how they were doing those things. So we were using Google Hangouts to record their screen, record their voices, and we wanted them to um, take us through exactly how they were actually answering these questions from the public or questions that they were having internally from the city. And then we just sat back and watched. Um, and you can learn a lot just by watching somebody's face as they're engaged in an activity like this. You can see immediately when they're getting frustrated um, with something. And after that, we took those um, Hangout on Airs, went back, reviewed them, took a bunch of notes on them, tried to identify some pain points. Um, and then it was time for us to, um, well, we realized a few things. Um, the main thing was that every user was pretty much trying to do the exact same thing. There was a very small set of questions they were trying to answer. Um, and those questions were, um, is something in the city? Um, it seems like a very, very simple question, but this was taking like literally like three minutes for somebody to answer a very, very simple question like this. So you can just imagine if you were working in a public works department for a city, an assistant calls you up and is complaining about an overflowing um, storm drain, and you have to sit for three minutes on the phone with that person while you're trying to figure out if their address is even in the city, if you're even the right person for them to be talking to. That's a really painful three minutes to be sitting on the phone with somebody. Um, kind of tied to that same issue was um, the question of who's responsible. So that goes back to that storm drain issue, um, figuring out who's actually responsible for that storm drain, to figure out if you're even the right person uh, for somebody to be talking to. Uh, the other thing that people were interested in was what's happening around a location. Um, so this could be um, stuff like crime, what type of crime is happening around an address, or what type of development is occurring in my neighborhood. Um, questions like that um, were the questions that um, folks in the city were, were needing to be uh, answered. Uh, and like I said before, these questions were taking minutes, sometimes up to like five minutes for these people to answer these questions. And these were folks in the city who worked with this software all the time. This was not f folks that were just citizens who were very unfamiliar with working with these, the software, who had, weren't GIS people at all. Um, so I could just imagine how much longer that would take for them to try to answer these questions. They, they, probably, they probably were not doing it at all. They probably just gave up and either that was why they were calling us or they just assumed that we were idiots and had a horrible website. <laughs> right. Um, so it was no wonder that we had tons of frustrated users like inside the city and citizens like you know, uh, just inside the, inside the city. Right, so I'm going to pass it back to Dave. So we get back to that spinning globe again because that's that it, re returning theme that kept happening with us with that existing stuff that people were, you know, they're waiting on the phone to give people answers and that's, all, that's what they saw. So we got some real useful information, right? So we knew that we had problems, and we kind of started identifying through those, you know, I'd call it more guerrilla user research. We didn't really go through like formal user research that you would use, but it was very simple and basic. We just wanted to get at this stuff as quickly as possible. Um, so then borrowing from that whole idea of lean startup, we wanted to build like a business model canvas, because what we really wanted to do is come up with the idea of 
identifying what the value proposition was, what's the problem, all the resources we're going to need. I mean, this is all the stuff you would do like in a startup, and we wanted to emulate that because, you know, we, we don't have a budget. We, it, it, we just, everything like we operate very much like a startup, and um, doing this um, helped us a lot. And I think it can help you too. So we also borrowed from Code for America, just kind of taking a little spin on the business model canvas. We took that they were using I'd seen um, somewhere. Um, I think it was uh, the C some of the fellows in Charlotte, North Carolina. Yeah, the, the Civic Tech. Um, impact campus, which is really the business model campus, but maybe engineered a little bit better towards um, doing like a civic tech project. Um, so the problems that we found were like, and this is really important, once you can start identifying problems and value propositions, then when you, then you have a better feel that the tool you're building is actually going to solve a real problem that people are having. And there's nothing worse than spending months and months building a tool and going to users. <laughs> and they're telling you there's stuff in the tool that's not working, but they don't really care because the tool's not something that solves anything they have. So you can, I'm not going to read it for you, but you can see the problems that we identified. Um, to me, this right here, that, that impact, that value proposition, this is, this is the most important piece. This was really what we used to define at the end what simplicity was going to be. So we wanted the information to be really, really easy to find. We didn't want to get in the way of people finding the info because they were really, they were looking for real basic information, stuff like when's my recycle picked up? And, and even that currently would have been a, a very hard task because the way they do it at the city is it's like the opposite day of your trash day, the following week on, on, and they call it recycle A or B. So first you have to go find when your recycle day is, or your trash day is, and then you have to go over to a chart that's color coded to figure out if you're an A or B, and then you have to decide, is that next Wednesday or th next Tuesday? So I'm sure that most people would look at their neighbors and say, is there, is there a cycle out? And, but that, that's, that's how they would find it, but this kind of tells you. So we knew that we needed to tell people exactly it's next Wednesday. That, that's how people communicate. Um, we wanted to decrease the time spent working. People were on our site, and I think it was mostly city employees looking at the analytics, but they were spending <laughs> a good amount of time looking for these answers, but I think we could decrease that, and then we could also decrease the time spent that city employees spent like talking to these people, so that, because they're an incredible waste of time to do. So the solution kind of matches up with that value proposition, just like you would do in a business model canvas. We talked, there's some ideas in here where we didn't really include in the MVP, and that was you know, from feedback, like the email subscriptions. And so just to, just to follow up with a couple of things on that, it took us about two hours to do this business model canvas on one afternoon. And I can't stress enough like how important it was through the entire development process to have done that first because it gave us something to look at the entire time we were moving through this process. Because it's really easy to get like lost in the weeds, you're writing code, you get wrapped up in some small piece of functionality and to like lose track of what the overall goal that you're actually trying to accomplish is. Um, so it's super important, it gives you something to look back at um, and actually figure out where you're going. Um, so um, after we kind of did the business model canvas, it was time for us to actually come up with an idea or what our, like, our MVP is actually going to be. Um, so we went back to the drawing board, uh, in this case a whiteboard, and sketched out. This is our really complex wireframe right here. I know it's kind of hard to see, um, but basically what we wanted to do is just have a place where you could search um, and then as soon as you search, the very first thing you would see is that it is in the city or not in the city, because um, we knew that was like the number one question that people were trying to answer. Um, and then down below that, we wanted to have this sort of question and answer format where um, you, know, you would ask the user a question, you know, do you want to know about crime? And they could check yes or no, and then they would get more detail about crime. Um, and so it kind of tied to that was um, the idea of only showing the user what they need to see at that particular moment. Um, and on the side, we sketched out a couple things um, uh, about kind of the, the database and API type stuff that we wanted to do because we were doing, wanted to uh, do some pre-processing on the data ahead of time um, to make it fast beca because we knew that that was something that was going to be really crucial for usability is actually making it fast and responsive because um, without it being fast, it's not really usable. Um, so once we had this MVP, it was time for us to um, actually build the software. And we pretty much just used uh, what we knew and what we had lying around. I had done a lot of ang AngularJS stuff at the, my previous job. Um, so that was something I natu naturally gravitated to. Um, so we went with kind of with what we knew. Um, 
Dave is super awesome at uh, Postgres and PostGIS, so that was a pretty natural fit right there. And uh, we had an ELA with Esri at the city, uh, and we didn't want to try to develop our own REST API, um, and we wanted to get this in front of users as fast as po possible, so we didn't want to spend three to six months writing a REST API. Um, so we just use ArcGIS's um, REST API that just comes out of the box. It's free for us to use, or not really free. It doesn't cost us actually anything extra because we already had an ELA um, agreement with Esri for the city. Um, so that was like kind of our technology stack. We're not really gonna go into that too much. Um, and I think I'm gonna pass it back to, to Dave about the next part. So something I wanna stress is like, we showed you the technology stack, but to me, the, like, the, that, that stack, it doesn't really matter. Because what really matters is to using that stack to build something that users can use. So this is the part that I think is probably the most important of the process is, is doing usability tests. And these don't have to be fancy or difficult or hard. And we're gonna go through like the steps that I, that I see that helped us kind of through the process. Um, and I think that anyone can do this. It's incredibly easy. Um, so first thing you need is real people, and it doesn't matter who they are. They don't need to be any certain type of person, just a person, because they'll tell you everything you need to know. Um, always use a script, and for, for us that we found that when we started tailoring the scripts to be more like scenarios, like um, if, if we were at a certain place, like at a coffee shop or with employees, we'd kind of come up with something that a scenario like they would encounter in real life, and we'd ask them to use the app in that way. The other thing is like I always think of it as talking more like a therapist. It's more like getting people to say, how do you feel about that? And trying to get people to talk because you know, that's what a therapist does. They never really say anything, but they force you to talk about it. You know, what we found really useful, we would use Google Hangouts on air to record it. So we would take the on air, do a screen share, and record the voice. So we would do things like we would go to the local coffee shop and we'd um, sit there with a pile of danishes and maybe um, offer them coffee and say, if you come join us, you know, we, first we went in, we said, if you join us for 30 minutes, you know, we'll give you danish. They looked at us like we were crazy. So we, we changed our mind and said, well, sit with us for 10 minutes. And then suddenly, you know, people were interested with the danish. Maybe if we offered them more money, that would be cool. But 10 minutes, danish. Um, so we would sit there and we had them say things like, there's a pothole in the street in front of where you live, um, use a site. Uh, to figure out how to get it fixed. And we'd watch them use it and um, try to pull out information about where they would struggle. Uh, we'd get a real, we went to a realtor office because they're a big user of information like that, looking up property information and anything, really. Uh, we'd ask them questions like this about crime. How would you give it to your client? Because we wanted to know how they gave it to a client because we had some stuff in the app about um, you know, emailing the link and stuff like that. We wanted to see if they use that, if that's what they wanted to use. Um, and getting feedback on that. Most of the time they couldn't find it, they just wanted to take snapshots actually. But <clears throat> we went into City Hall and we asked them to use it. Um, we asked them questions like this. So you can see that the, the theme is easy. Anyone can come up with questions like this to ask users. So I wanna go over like things we learned. Um, after the usability tests, we would do usually three, sometimes four people in each group. <clears throat> and after that, we rewatch the Hangouts, because when you do the Hangouts on air, it records the um, YouTube, which is super helpful. We kind of identify the pain points and discuss where we thought they were struggling. And then, <clears throat> then we would identify issues on GitHub, and we try to fix it. So now that we fix what we found that first time, we can come back a second time. We can ask similar questions, right? We could see what's fixed. So let's kind of go through a few examples. So on our first try with users, this is what the interface looked like, very simple. We thought, we went really, really simple. When we asked people what they thought this site did, and they'd say, I'm not sure. Something about city data being simple. <laughs> it, it, there was like nothing to indicate what to search, so we just said, you know, search something, and they would start typing in things like Monford, which is a neighborhood in Asheville, and you can see how much results they got from that. And, and, that, and that was intentional, we wanted, we wanted them to like, to see what the users decided to type in naturally without like prompting them to type in like a PIN number or something like that. Yeah, that I mean, if, if you're familiar, of, that's a personal identification number. That's a very governmental way of asking someone to search. I mean, no one 
searches for a pen. But then we um, brought it over. We changed it a little bit, added some things, like a little like indication that this was actually for search. Um, and we went to a realtor's office, and he started typing in things like this complete phrase, because he thought it was Google. He thought that we could be like Google, um, apparently, and, and typed this property identification number pin at the end. Um, and he get, again, he got no, no results, which really isn't too good. Um, so this is where the feedback starts coming in. We knew we had to like, <laughs> overcome stuff like when someone types in 275, 275 Flat Creek Road, and it gives results. After that, we can disregard everything because it's giving zero results, right? So then they'll actually get something back. When people finally got it, because we were giving some feedback, and they'd start typing in the addresses in this first couple of phrases, they get info back. And this is when they got excited um, because they were actually getting to stuff very quickly. So you, you start some of those mistakes and those things, which was kind of weird. But in the, in the real estate office, it was really interesting. They'd get to this point, click on the property, get back information, and they're like, oh my gosh, this is like light years ahead of what we, it's like Google. And we're like, really? It doesn't even really work. <laughs> but he, but he was, he's, you know, they're getting really excited and they're like, when can we start using it? And actually, like nothing really worked. We just pushed data back there and faked it out. Um, but we were, that was good feedback, right? That's, so talking to these users, we were learning really quickly that, yeah, we're making something people want to use. So now you're starting to see there's some differences. So now, um, after some feedback, we knew we had to put like a little bit more about what this product's gonna do, right? So we have that little blurb about discovering city data, some cues about what you can search for. Um, so now when you search in Momford, after this time, suddenly now you can get results, because we knew people were going to want to search by neighborhoods. And underneath you can see some of the categories of results that come back. So th to me, this is probably the, the most interesting thing that we learned during all these usability tests. So this is um, crime data. And um, one of our scenarios, we had asked people to come on, because we wanted to see if it was usable to like switch between um, time, like if people could figure that out. So we asked people to like provide crime over the past five years. The default is the last year. <clears throat> so users would come, this, several people would come on during the usability test and they would switch to five years and they would stop for a second. And they'd kind of look around and then they'd click and go to 10 years and they'd go back to five years and they'd hit back and then they'd go forward. And this happened, um, with all three users, and by the, the second user, I was like, something's going on here, so I started probing them, what, probing them, what, what are you thinking when you're going back, what's happening? And he's like, everyone said, well, it's not updating. But what was happening was, it, we had this long list of crimes organized by date with the newest one on top. So in our, in our quest to make this quick, it was happening so quickly, he could not even notice, no one noticed that the crime was actually updating beneath it. So what we decided to do was to put a little spinner when that changed and actually add one second, two seconds to the process. So the, the next usability test, we, we tested the same thing. And all three users, their first reaction was, this is so fast. So sometimes you have to slow down to be faster. But that also moves that needle more away from that spinning flat globe that everyone was pissed off about. So that's kind of where we ended, right? So now we ended at simplicity. And um, the and usability. Uh, so what we thought we'd do now is we can do two things. Um, I thought we would do like a quick um, usability test just, just to show you how easy it is and how important it is. But we're going to do an actual live usability test. So who wants to be the subject? Somebody has to volunteer. I need somebody. Come on up. So this is it. You only need a person. So now we have a person, right? All right. Can you sit down right there? Okay. So the other, the, we're going to skip one part because it, it, it would get a little bit more complicated live. But normally right now, we would go in and we'd start our Google Hangout on air, start the recording. We tell the user, hey, we're going to record you. We're not going to record your face. It's just the interactions on the screen and your voice. And 
we're doing that so we can save it and share it for later so that we know how to improve things we're doing. We'd also tell them that you're not going to do anything wrong here today. If we're, you're testing us, we're not testing you. So there's nothing wrong you can do up here. Okay. And, and, and as you do stuff, we want you to kind of think out loud and narrate what you're doing. Um, so if you're like confused about something, say that. Say why you're confused. Um, if you if something's not working, tell us that it's not working. Just kind of speak out loud. Okay. And um, so yeah. Yeah, so before start. you start, like okay. okay, take a look at the screen. Okay. okay? Um, no clicking around, but just kind of tell me what you think this product might do. Uh, it looks like it's a search portal for finding data. I'm oh, sorry. It looks like it's a search portal for finding data about, uh, I'm not really sure what. <laughs> Discover city data about places in your community. Okay, street address. So this is maybe I can get data about a particular address or maybe a neighborhood or an intersection or, uh, yeah, that's what, that's what it looks like at this point. You wanna do the scenario? Sure. Um, so at this point in time, we usually ask the person, um, like, just to kind of get a feel of like their level of comfort with dealing with stuff on the internet. Just roughly, like, how many hours a week do you spend on the internet? <laughs> or <laughs> uh, no comment. Uh, uh, well, I'm uh, a web developer, also from North Carolina, actually from Raleigh. Um, I spend so I spend all 40 hours of my work week on the internet, and probably another. Jeez, <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> I don't know anywhere from zero to twenty at home. <laughs> I don't know somewhere around there. A lot. I spend most of my life on the internet. I'll just be honest. <laughs> cool. And, that, and that's really just to kind of get a gauge just before we even start of where their level of comfort is, because um, a lot of times we're doing this with folks that aren't really super comfortable um, with stuff online. Um, so at this point, we would launch into like a set of scenarios. So we would give them a scenario, um, and then they would try to use simplicity to accomplish that scenario. So your scenario is, um, so you're in Asheville recently, and you are, uh, I guess, doing a brewery tour on the, on the south slip of Asheville. Um, and you're in front of Eagle Nest Outfitters, and you notice some construction that was going on there. Um, can you use simplicity to figure out what that construction might have been. Um, yeah, okay, so, how do we want to move this down? So, uh, so you can like type and talk. Oh, okay, yeah, there we go. So my first instinct is to type in, you said Eagle Nest Outfitters? Yeah, Eagle's Nest Outfitters. Eagle's. And for those who don't know, those are those Eno you know, parents that people that scrim their trees and parks and camping. Um, Made in downtown Asheville? So let's see, I've got streets, addresses, more. So tell, tell us about what you're thinking right now. Well, what I, you're expecting to see. I, I guess I was expecting to maybe see like, you know, uh, well, I mean, I'm conditioned by Google to expect to see like a little map that says, okay, this is where it is and here, you know, uh, but seeing this stuff it makes me think okay eagles nest outfitters is probably on eagles nest drive that's just a guess but i'm gonna so i would probably just click on this and see oh wait did i i went too far there we go uh do you want to know about the properties along this street um so to tell us the process you're going through right now as you're looking through this okay so right now i'm looking for something that says that tells me what is on Eagle's Nest Drive. Maybe a map or um, something of that nature. Do you want a list of addresses along the street? Do you want to, uh, so I would probably go with, hmm. So do you, what were you looking for originally in this scenario? I'm looking for construction. So maybe I want to know who is responsible for maintaining this street. That probably makes the most sense at this point. So just to circle back around, it's actually Eagle Nest. Oh, it's oh, Eagle. Oh, okay. So there, all right, let's back up then. But, but but despite that, you can start to see what the, the usability test is giving you right away, right? You're seeing maybe some things that are going on with the app that we could improve to make the experience for him better. 
Do we want to know about the... I'll point out one thing. Like One of our key questions that almost every user had come to us with was, um, is it in the city, right? And that was the first thing up top. And very clear, just, it's, yes, it's in the city. Uh, okay, so I went, uh, so I, I clicked on, I typed in Eagle Nest, and then I just clicked on the first address, and I clicked on, do you want to know about the property at this address? And then I clicked on Map View to see the map. So, um, the next thing I'm, I think, I guess the next thing I'm going to do is go, you mentioned a neighborhood, was it, uh, South Slope. So, it South Slope. so maybe uh, maybe I'll, uh, that my next instinct is to think maybe I just need the neighborhood, and that might uh, give me some. Yeah, I don't think South Slope's actually an artificial neighborhood. Oh really? Okay. <laughs> um, okay. So then I might try. Uh, what were the other piece, bits of information I have? Um, Do so I know it, what street it's on? It's right next on? to Catawba Brewing. How about that? Catawba Brewing? Okay, so. I'm really curious to see why. Uh, brewing. Oh, okay. There so uh, there's one on Brook Street and one on Banks, so I'm just going to click on. Oh, it's on Banks? Yeah. So, okay. Uh, so you can see all kinds of stuff, right? Because every, everyone's seeing what he's doing. It, we didn't ask him to do anything complicated, right? But you can you can see some usability problems, I'm sure. And when we get through this, we can we'll talk about it. When he's doing the page back, is he going two clicks back? I would think he would maybe leave his query in the box so you could edit it rather than type the whole thing. Yeah, yeah, but this is exactly yeah. what yeah. The, what, when we finish the usability test, these are all the things we bring back, but this is good, right? Because we're seeing problems with an actual user. And you're seeing that he doesn't have to fit any demographic of any person that would actually use it because it's really just a person using it. And we're getting all kinds of good feedback. Like right now, I can already see things that we need to go back and put in GitHub issues that there's, there's still problems and there always will be. And this is not something that, can, that ever stops. You should always be doing usability. Even um, even when you've done it so much or you're having trouble finding problems, there should always be something that you should be testing. Because yeah. you can always improve it. Yeah, and I, and I think, the, think the key is like something like this, like I was able to run through this right before we started and get to the data. But that's because like I work with this all the time, so I know exactly how to search for stuff and where stuff is. Um, but obviously, it's not that easy. So, um, yeah. So if we go back to the topics, mm -hmm. and I'm going to show everyone now. Usually in the usability, when people get to like a struggle, like I'll try to stop them after a little bit, and then then we'll sh and then we'll sh show them. But if if you're at banks, and if you look at right here, you can hover over that. It says, "Do you want to know about development at this address?" That that's what we were expecting. But something about that when we said you know construction or development that that didn't cue him. So we know that there's usability problems, and I think. Someone else pointed out other stuff. But it, I mean, did you guys see anything else that, that was like a usability issue in that part? Like, you can just start talking to you. Uh, the quick thing, you uh, show the list of everything on the icons, but there's so much text that they, and they all say, do you want to? And I thought, maybe you do you want to? And there's less text. And maybe you can find it for you. Yeah, that's a, that's, a, that's a great idea. And then, you know, doing that and then doing the usability tests on that, same with just another person and see what happens. I noticed that uh, you, you had specifically mentioned the business, but it didn't look like that particular business was in your database. Yeah, so I don't know why that didn't come up. It came up like literally like 30 minutes ago. And that's actually, <laughs> it's actually the, the, the Google Places API, so I'm shocked that it didn't. Okay. Yeah. Oh. Yeah, and, well, one thing I found was um, you don't necessarily know how many categories of, of information there are in there, and there's a more button. So you don't necessarily know what's further down the list. Um, just, you know, I, I expected to say the business to be under the places heading, but that might have been further down. You had to hit the more button to get it to show up. So you, you know the answers for all these questions right now. So you could have the answers on this page instead of making them to click through to those pages. Like, there were 17 crimes near this address. 
That's interesting. I, mean, that, I think that would get to, get to be a lot, lot of information on one yeah. page. Yeah, yeah. It could get to that. So it's kind of like we've thought about, like, how do we take all of this information that the city has? And, and as this builds out further, like, it's even more that gets hard to manage. So that's kind of where that thought came from. But that would be interesting to test that. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, the search button actually doesn't even do anything. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> 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 anyway. That's such a great. That's a great one. That's something, that's something to definitely look at. It might be useful in the autocomplete. Uh, it showed the type of entity it is, like it's a business or owner. It had the icon next to the text. That's great. That's great. I just had a question. What would have happened if you put in more data? If you had said, the here's the address, and you had added the word construction. Um. So it, it actually, if you put the address in first, um, and then the word construction. Yeah, right? so it would have just returned the address. Um, okay. Basically, like it's, it keeps returning results from like the geocoder um, until it gets to something that's returned to zero, and then it'll just return the last. Thing. So it, adding construction doesn't like actually narrow it down at all. I mean, it, we, it's not really that fancy of a search, but it, it can. We're hoping to fake it out by like ignoring that part and just putting construction. I think at some point, as we get further, because I, I, we consider this like the start, like the first thing we were trying to do and where we're at now is like, we wanted to prove that people did not want the map in the map and have to go through the process of discovering this information through the map. But they wanted it presented more like this. So I, I think we kind of proved that. I felt like we have, because you can see in the analytics that people outside the city are using this way more than they've ever used anything that we've ever put out before. But now we're talking more about the stuff that, you, that, that you're that you all mentioning, right? Because now we can start actually working on that and making that better. But you can see that that wasn't very hard. We, we made this up right here, right now, right? To do this usability test and just did it in front of you. It took, what, 10 minutes? So this, this is not something that's hard and anyone in the room can do it and everyone should be doing it. Because every time you do this and every iteration you do it, you're gonna get better and your product's gonna be better, and, and, your use, and your customers will notice. When, you, when your crime data gets returned, and you put a spinner in and you slow it down, and they're happy instead of mad, because they think nothing happened, that, that's a big change. And um, especially for government-style apps. And uh, that, yeah, that's, that's what I wanted to kind of bring everyone's attention to. So. Um, you just, you just gotta yeah, we gotta give oh, this yeah, guy a round of applause. up and helping. Uh, I think they might have cupcakes floating around here. <laughs> so, um, like, what I want to leave you with is, um, I want to challenge everybody to like. Now it's your turn, right? To, I want everyone to go out there. If you're working on a product, even if you're not working on a product, if you have something that people use, to go out there and talk to people who use it and try to make it better. And then, if you can, I, I would love if everybody went out and made their own simplicity. So, thank you. Is there any questions you have for us? So, I mean, we're using Google Analytics and um, we've tagged everything. So, we, we do know which stuff people are clicking on. But in the city, because that comes up by default, we don't. But um, the stuff that people are always interested in, crime is the one that always it leads everything by far every time. And then it's development and then it's all the rest. So they're all pretty equal, um, pretty spread out. But definitely, crime development are the two biggest things people always look at. Yeah. Um, so, you know, d it depends on days. Like, we're averaging, I think, um, page views. It, it was in the um, two to 300, which in the past, 
Um, and that's, and most of our traffic in the past has all been internal people, and it was more like 100 hit page views a day. So we've doubled that, and it's all people who aren't, who never used our product before. Do you do any analysis of search terms and have you modified the product based on what you're seeing people search for, like the places versus addresses and stuff like that? Mm -hmm. um, a little bit. So what most people are searching by address. I think that's like the most natural way. And then the places seem to come up like second. Um, that, that's what I've seen in the analytics, but it kind of changes. I think it depends on what they're searching for. But we haven't dug into it that deep yet. Yeah. So as you were you're building this application, uh, you're having conversations, obviously, with different departments in your city. Mm -hmm. um, how did you start those conversations? What were you, I guess, can you maybe talk about uh, uh, asking for their data in order to include it in your application? So um, I work in the IT department, or have worked in the IT department. We hold all the data, so we're the manager of it. We just took it and put it in there. <laughs> um, so, yeah, we, we like I, I operate under like I'm just gonna do it, and if I get in trouble, I'll you know ask for forgiveness. But most of the time, it's gonna work out. So that's how I took care. That's what I did with that. Um, did you get trouble at all? No, not at all. No one yelled. I have a question related to that. Was there anyone else that you partnered with to get data, like the county and our preschool districts, or is it all city data? Well, so we do work with the county directly. And, and where we where we are, so some of the data is actually county data that we pull over, but we have an agreement that's a that to do that, so it's not a big deal. So we pull it over every night. I think that answers the question. Okay, I believe collection of public collection actually has been outsourced to a private sector. So I'm not sure about Asheville, but in that situation, do you have a situation like this? No, the, our, our tra we do all our trash internal, so the sanitation department picks up the trash. The, they do <coughs> do the um, recycles, but um, the, way I, the way it seems to work, and, and I'm not 100% sure, is that the sanitation department um, works with that vendor to the, do the pickup days and when they're going to happen, and then we kind of um, curate that for them. So th that wasn't a problem getting data about like when the recycle day is. They try to follow the trash days so it's less confusing. But okay. you know, I love the fact that you guys use the green canvas or you know made your own version. Um, was that your first time using it on this project, or have you already been using green canvas methods? I've, I've used the, biz, the business canvas model on all kinds of stuff, so it wasn't like something new. I'd used it in other projects, so like using it here. This was the first time, I think, that we used all of this stuff together. So, and, and I, also have a, 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 I also run the Lean Startup Circle in, in Asheville, so I've taken a lot of people through the business model canvas doing that. In the back. Yeah, can people report an issue back to the city through this? Yes. So the maintenance responsibility portion, if if someone were to go on there and the let's say the street and was that was out front of the address is actually maintained by the city, it will um, give you a direct link and it interacts with our um, 311 API. So they could report it and then find out if it gets fixed. If it's an agency like um, the North Carolina Department of Transportation, it, it gives them a phone number, the person to contact, and a web link to report problems in the same way. And, and there's like a questions and comments email address that people can send stuff to um, if there's issues with simplicity. Uh, even though our city doesn't have all the data available that you have, mm -hmm. if we wanted to implement something like it in our city, is there some way to do it? Is it like in any part of the open or public? Yep. And do you want to answer? Yeah, so yeah, it's it's all open source. Um, well, the, the entire front end of the site is open source, and all of the the pre-processing of the data that we do is just like a Node Postgres um, setup. So that's entirely open source. Um, I guess the only non-open source component would be the fact that the back end is running on the ArcGIS REST API. Um, a lot of cities have that, so um, um, it could definitely could be something you could set up fairly quickly. The, the kind of like one like gotcha kind of thing on that is that the schema of the data that we're using um, is kind of like 
our schema. Um, it's something that we've talked about wanting to do is move towards some sort of standard schema so that it would be a lot easier for, for different municipalities to implement it. And to speak up to that more, like we've, we've been in conversations to partner with Code for America too, to make simplicity more redeployable. It's, you know, like I said, it's really MVP now, and that part of the MVP wasn't really how we make it redeployable, it was this, test this part. So I think like, like some of the next steps are stuff like making it redeployable, so we need to do it. But yeah, you could just get it from GitHub. It's on, it's on the city's GitHub. Sorry. I mean, we, we might do that. Uh, we're all pro bono here, but uh, it, it, do, you, do you envision like people contributing back to it and helping to improve it? Yes. And all that? Yes. Definitely. Uh, as a business development are you are you guys looking into kind of uh, demographic based uh, information so for business like incentives? Are there any uh, geographic and how many restaurants are in a um, you know mile radius so that the two grows the small business kind of connect? Yeah. No, we haven't thought about that. That, that's a great idea. That's even better information to add. It'd be cool to add that. Yeah, we're, we're using a nation builder as a platform in order to sense of to try and attract this big business to come to the city and, uh, and actually really promote uh, PR and marketing within the small business economy, giving them a platform for just an addition. Uh, I saw the map view of, of like the kind of the block that we use, uh, block the lot, and kind of say, give them a developer standpoint and kind of understand even more and go in depth on yeah, that's a great idea. Any other questions? Yeah, I wanted to ask, uh, do you have uh, any features currently in development or is the roadmap defined as this point? So, <clears throat> the, you know, if you wanted like a big full roadmap, we don't necessarily have one. But as far as what we have, what we're thinking next, um, it's like split up into two repos. We have a repo for the back end where the, we do the data processing, and we have like the repo on GitHub for the front end. And right now, the way we're tracking it is just through the GitHub issues. So if you want to see what we're thinking next, that's where that's at. And um, the other cool thing is GitHub is all about contribution. So um, well, I would encourage people, like if they thought things would be really cool to add to it, to put it into an issue on GitHub. And that's something that we can think about and try to figure out how to put into that, that roadmap. And, and that's something I want to like articulate even, even more like on the readme of, uh, of the, the UI side of it, is actually fully articulating where we actually want this to go and ways for people to actually contribute to the project. Um, that's something I've definitely neglected doing up to this point. Um, but it is, and I don't think we said this before, but it is on the City of Asheville's GitHub page. So it's just City of Asheville, GitHub. Um, and there's Simplicity-UI and Simplicity Backend are the two repositories for it. Currently it's MIT, so it's, you know, I think that MIT is like one of the older, more um, open type of licenses, so that, and that's the idea. We, you know, the, the, the day of licensing, yeah, we've discussed that a lot. Like, I, yeah, I think you have to have a license, but I think it should be the most open possible. Especially when you're a public agency, I think that we develop things. When we're a public agency, that, that it, it's the public's domain. We built it with tax dollars. It doesn't really belong to anyone. But at the same time, I think if a business wanted to take simplicity code and form a business out of it, I think that should be okay too. Um, and, and so that's kind of the, the idea behind MIT. Um, I could see it being switched to something else. I just don't know what that is. How do people find it? Yeah, that, that's a good question. Um, if you search simplicity um, in Asheville, you'd get to it. And it's also the URL is simplicity.ashvillenc.gov. It is. Yeah, yeah. If, if you go to it's ashvillenc.gov, and there's a link right on the left hand side to simplicity. That might be a little difficult to find, but some, that's just the nature of our website right now. Any other, any other questions? Yeah. <coughs> so, if you close the loop with analytics uh, to internal city departments, like you're seeing certain behavioral trends, uh, do you go back to the like, business owners around saying trash pickup and saying, hey, we're seeing this kind of trending? Uh, you may want to. Uh, be more uh, vocal about how you advertise your service. Can you close that loop? Not yet. 
No, I, I think that as more people use it, that would be a great thing to start doing. Um, and maybe even use use some of those analytics to do even more things. But like for now, it's just like, are people using it? Right. Mm -hmm. Anything else? All right. Awesome. Well, thank you. Yeah, thanks, guys. Thank